We're excited about this series. This is our first in a year-long series devoted to economics and theology. Most people, including a very large part of the economics profession, are actually should be here at the theological mm -hmm. seminary or I some agree. other, uh, because <laughs> they're not uh, science. Uh, it's, it's, it's a theology mm -hmm. in which it, it's faith-based. We're constantly trying to have a conversation about the deep dimensions of human life. Jesus doesn't talk a lot about calculated consequences or, you know, the, the, the kinds of things that we talk about in social ethics all the time. Um, but th what there is there is a kind of a, a love ethic uh, that, that, that throws you into a social justice struggle and keeps you in it and makes you angry and helps you fight for another day and doesn't sort of calculate the efficacy of what you're doing by this, you know, the immediate success. I'm pleased to find out in this discussion that economics is now the opiate of the masses. Uh, <laughs> gives me, it gives me a feeling that I'm on the right track trying to get them off that opiate. One of the inspirations to work with you and to build a dream of theological and economic mutual nourishment, we need to evolve away from these points, these, these stale myths where we're stuck. We need to regenerate and renew the psychology that underpins how we think about ourselves and our, each other. Economists pretend in their models that people don't care about each other. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's one of the basic building blocks of consumer theory. Mm -hmm. That's pretty close to obviously wrong. And that was one of the things that INET is trying to, mm -hmm. to do is to uh, the old expression, ex, ex, uh, science has changed not, uh, you know, one, what is it, one death at a time. Uh, it's only as you get young people, and it's young people who do, are more receptive. You know, they, 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 they see what's going on and they say, I haven't spent 20 years devoted to a false theory of wasting my time, um, which is very hard for people to admit. Uh, they say, I don't want to waste my time, and they adopt new th newer mm -hmm. theories. This conversation belongs in a seminary, in a, in a theological context as well as in politics because um, it's a way of thought. The way we think about economics and capitalism um, is a way of thought that shapes our values. There's also this theme of sin that runs through it all that is this constant insistence that, that if, you, if you leave people to their own devices and don't put constraints around it, there it's going to veer off, um, which is interesting in, in hearing you discuss the, the sort of sense that somehow in this model that's prevalent, uh, it should be self-corrective because of the moral instincts of those engaged in it. We, we have to make this distinction so we can call ideology ideology when it occurs and without bashing a whole um, profession. For what Sister Betty Sue says, she doesn't want to bash the discipline. There's a sense in which I do. We're about the art of living well, loving well, laughing well, and dying with smiles on our faces, and some of us with expectations. Now, what does that mean? That means, therefore, that when we really talk about even interest properly understood, which is so rich in it, your last chapter about another world, yeah, I think that's still too narrow. So if we, even if we convinced the 1% it was in their interest properly understood to be motivated, that's not enough. The great movements in America, abolitionism, civil rights movement, feminist movement, anti-homophobic movement, they didn't argue we need self-interest properly understood. <laughs> if that was the slogan, black folks still be in Jim Crow, <laughs> right? And women with something else was going on. Strong moral forces, strong spiritual sources linked to stories about a nation mm -hmm. in terms of national identity, in terms of what it means to be human, our connection to other countries. And that's, I think, where a place like Union Seminary, which in so many ways has been pushed to the margin because the story we tell about the least of these, the kind of story Donald Shriver told in his letter to the New York Times, is unsettling because he wasn't talking about interest. He was talking about something deeper. What it means to be human such that service to others, service to the least of these, is the best way of being human in time and space, and he's willing to live and die for that. The tradition, all men are created equal, the land of opportunity. This is a place that where the stories are being contradicted 
by Joe's evidence, which is the basis, it's the fuel. We don't always adhere to our principles as a society, but if we have those principles and we don't become cynical and say we're romantic fools for trying to believe in them, if we use them to energize a regeneration, we do have a chance. Something you're describing in a language of economics uh, it sort of resonates in profound ways with something that is described theologically in the language of a story about reality. And I think that is so exciting to begin to see where those, those places of strong resonance and overlap are, particularly with respect to what it takes to get the, the stories going in this country that are about enduring change. It feels like all of us, and all of us are relatively privileged, relatively well-educated, the question I ask of you is that we are looking into each other's eyes at this point in history, and we're asking each other, should we help this captain and navigator get off the ice, or should we put the jewels from the safe and the fruit from the galley in our own personal lifeboat? And I experience fear, I experience dread, of the direction that things are going, the vicious circles that Joe's talked about. And the reason I'm here is I don't think I have any choice. And I want to ask you to help me and to help us at INET to get off the ice.